time to look at a new screen upgrade for a Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Hi and welcome back to The Shed. I'm Joe Bleeps and today I'm going to be doing a build of a Nintendo Game Boy Advance. Someone asked me recently if I had a video on my channel showing how to do any upgrades and installs on Game Boy Advance and although I thought I did because I have done these builds in the past it must have been before I started doing my channel so I am currently bereft of Game Boy Advance tutorials so let's put that right. I've recently ordered a new laminated ITA TFT kit from Z Labs in the UK. It's made by Funny Playing and it's an all-in-one screen kit. So it's in the pack here, we'll take a look in a bit, but it's got the screen attached to the lens, which means no dusk in between, which is always a nuisance when you're doing these upgrades. So I did want to try that out. This is actually a TFT screen, so it's not one of the more modern IPS screens, but we'll talk about the advantages, the disadvantages of those during the video. Now, one slight caveat of these kits is that they don't really fit in the existing Game Boy Advance shell. It would take a lot of work and it'd be really fiddly to do to trim it into a situation where you'd be able to use it. So Funny Playing also sell a custom molded shell which fits the original Game Boy Advance parts and the screen kit. So I've bought one of those too. I've bought some buttons to go with it. So let's just stop chatting and start with the build. So before we get going, a little bit of background information. This is an original Nintendo Game Boy Advance console. Now, unlike the Game Boy Advance SP, this console launched with a color screen, much like the Game Boy Color, that did not have a backlight or front light or any kind of light. In fact, it was more difficult to see than the original Game Boy screens, but it was color. It was able to run some awesome games, so I still enjoyed playing on it very much. But when the Game Boy Advance SP came along, like this one here, I was all over over it. I love the clamshell design. I love the fact that it had a front lit screen. Now you can't even really see it very much in this light, but trust me, there is a light in there. It's a little up light that shines up this way. And in fact, one of the first modifications I did on the original Game Boy Advance was to harvest the front light panel from one of these that was broken and install it into this shell here with a reasonable amount of success. If I turn it that way, you can see it does light up and it still works. I mean, it's a far cry from many of the other games. Game Boy mods I've done before but it was one of the earliest ones I'd done it was something that other people weren't doing so much at the time so I've kept it just because you know I'm nostalgic <laughs> that's why I spend all my time building these old consoles but anyway so yeah that was the AGS001 the original front lit Game Boy Advance SP now that was replaced at a later date in particular in the US not so common in Europe with the AGS101 screen which is backlit which is crisp, which is brightness controllable when you tap on the little brightness control button like this. It's really, really good. Pixel perfect to match the original Game Boy Advance. Now, recent modifications like the one I've done on this Game Boy Advance here, is a IPS screen, which is a much more modern screen. It's bigger if you look at it compared to the 101 there. It's brighter, the colors are more vibrant, but it loses that kind of pixel perfect representation of the original screen. So the thing is with this, that a lot of these new developments tend to make our old favorites more usable, yes, but also something more modern and, and slightly more far removed from the original appeal. So many people still argue that the AGS 101 one is like the happy medium between not being able to really see what you're looking at but keeping that authenticity as opposed to the IPS. Now it wasn't until years after the AGS 101 screens came out that a whole batch of leftover screens turned up on the market and people figured out a way of being able to install them in the original console that it became popular to actually mod on the original Game Boy Advance but like you can see on this one here it does make for a really nice form factor and the screen looks nice with the original 101 style screen in there. So this is what was the most popular mod on the Game Boy Advance for a long time. The size of the screen matches the original. It's got that authenticity, but it's not quite got that brightness, that vibrance, and the larger screen size of the IPS ones. Now I have done a build of a Game Boy Advance with an IPS screen inside it, um, but I don't think I did a video of that one. I have got some photos somewhere, so I'll maybe upload them in the video at this point so you can have a look what that looked like. And I am planning on doing another IPS build in future. However, the thing is, I am a big fan of these laminated kits. That's what I've got in this one here. It means that the screen is bonded to the lens so you don't get any dust in between. So even though there's a little bit of dust there, it just sweeps off. I'm a big fan of these because I have spent years and years 
and years of trying to ensure that in the gap between these lenses and these screens, there is no dust and it's an incredibly frustrating task. So when I found out that there was a kit available, it's just come in recently on Z Labs, you can install a backlit screen with a laminated display into a Game Boy Advance. I was all over it. Now they do have an IPS version coming up soon, so I'll be trying out that, but I was keen to see what this new one would look like. Now, what we've got here is a screen that you will have seen before. It's not a Game Boy Advance screen but it's actually the same screen model as you would find in the lower screen of a DSi. Now in fact the resolution of this screen matches exactly the resolution of the number of pixels on the Game Boy Advance. Now I did a bit of preparation before the video. It uses a DSi lower screen which is a TFT screen and has a resolution of 240 by 1 160. That matches both. So when you install it and when you run the Game Boy Advance games, it's a pixel perfect resolution. So it's an ideal choice for installing in one of these. However, it's also not compatible. So you need the kit, you need the ribbons and all the clever technology that Funny Playing put into their kits to allow you to be able to use this screen, nice photo there, on one of these consoles. So that is what we are going to do once I've tidied away all of this lot. So I mentioned earlier, I took a few notes. Really, this is just to guide me through through this process so that I can explain the process to you. I've looked at various tutorials, instructions, videos, things like that, particularly for the previous version of this screen that didn't have the laminated front and combined what I can in there. So hopefully I'm well prepared for it. There is some soldering involved. Now it does now include a built-in brightness adjuster, one of those where you can kind of tap on the top of the console and it increases or decreases the brightness. So you can actually get away with installing this and not doing any soldering. However, if you want more control what you can do is there is a setting where you can adjust the position of the screen. I mean, with the laminated display, it should be perfectly lined up anyway, but just in case it's not, I'd like to install, it's just like three wires. And what you can do is you press and hold a number of buttons, and then it brings up an option where you can change the vertical and horizontal positioning of the screen to get it just right in your lens. Also, it gives you the option to control where you can hold the select button and use the L and R buttons to adjust the brightness, which I quite like. So we'll take a look at that as we go along, but I will be doing some soldering, but keep thing is you can do this kit without any soldering at all. The wiring is like a, an optional extra. So really it's just a drop in, connect, put together kind of job. So it should be quite easy. If you're going to solder, you're going to need solder. You're going to need a soldering iron. I just use a Antex 18 watt soldering iron. It's not adjustable. I've got a fine tip on it and it tends to do me well for most of my projects. I don't think you really need anything too fancy. I have got some soft solder. I've got some wire ready, although there may well be some with the kit. I've also got a test cut cart for a Game Boy Advance. Again, not something that you need, but it will be useful and we'll take a look at that later. And in terms of what I have bought, of course, we need an original Game Boy donor console. This one works fine. I've got the screen kit, which we'll open up in a minute. The shell, gone with a sort of clearish purple for this one. And I got some buttons. Now I got some of the NTSC Super Nintendo style buttons. So we'll see how those go and how those fit with this. I know it's not the gray shell, but I thought with those sort of purple and violet hues, it might be quite nice with this shell. It might look hideous. I don't know. We'll find out. Anyway, so we'll move the shell out of the way for now. We'll move our console out of the way. I've tested it. It does work. We'll see what's in this kit. I do like the Z Labs packaging on everything. It keeps it all safe when you get the big packages and there's all sorts of stuff in there. Right now, because it's not a screen that is actually designed for use in the original console, the kit comes with an injection molded panel that is designed to hold the screen in the right position in relation to the inside of the shell. So that is a very important part of the kit. And I was informed by Z Labs that this was the bit that was delayed. So they've had the screen kits for a little while, but they didn't have the brackets. So they were unable to sell the kits, but now they've got them and I can get my hands on one and try it out now in the bag here. We have the ribbons. We'll take a look at those in a moment. It does come with wires already. It's quite nice, actually. It's got three wires that are all pre-tinned. So you don't really need to do, if you're doing any soldering, you don't need to do all the cutting and stripping and things like that. So that's a bonus. And it looks like I may not need my wire after all. The screen itself, you have to handle this just like you would any expensive new screen. If you've got a new screen for your phone or something like that, it's delicate. You need to handle it the same way. So we've got that already attached, which is definitely a plus because I am quite poor at attaching ribbons in these little connectors. So it's quite nice that that bit is already attached there. And as we've discussed already, this is a sandwich display. It means that the glass lens is already attached to the front of the screen 
between. It means there'll be no gap between the two, which will look pretty good. It means that there's no dust in between the two either. Now, if you look at it here, it looks like it's all scratched up and everything else. That is just the plastic covering over the front of the lens. So that's all fine. We've got that part, which is our screen. We've got the bracket. And in here, we've got the wires, which we've already discussed. And we've got two ribbons. Now, the thing with the Game Boy Advance is you can get one and until you open it up, you don't know which model you've got. Some have got a 40 pin model, which is 40 pins on the little connector. And some have got, I think it's 38, 32. Anyway, there's a 40 pin and there's the one that isn't. If it turns out you've got the 40 pin version, there's a capacitor that you need to remove. So we'll look at that once we're inside. It's time to open up the Game Boy Advance and see what model we've got. So I'll take off the battery cover, take out the batteries. Now the screws in here are the Tri-Wing type, which are very favored by Nintendo in their consoles, their handheld consoles anyway. So I have a Tri-Wing screwdriver. I'll get all of those out. Now there's actually also a Phillips head screw, a little black one there that's easy to miss, so just watch out for that. So that's a total of seven screws to remove, six of the tri-wing and one Phillips screw. That should enable us to separate out the two halves of the shell. So I'll just move the back half over here. Separating out, we've got the two sort of side brackets. We've got the left and right shoulder buttons. On the inside, there are also three Phillips head screws, one here, one here, and no more. Sometimes there is another one over here. Sometimes you get them and the screw is just not in there. So. This bracket here is where the original LCD is attached. So if I just use a spudger to nudge up the connector here and here, it'll allow me to remove the ribbon as I lift out the motherboard. And that just becomes detached there. Inside the shell now, I've got the silicon connectors for all the buttons, which I will need. This light pipe for the LED, I'm not sure if that comes with the new kit, so I'll pop that out as well. I'll leave the screen in place. I'll take the power switch in case I need that and the A and B buttons, just in case the purple ones I've bought are no good. So I can take my original front half and my screen and my original back half, pop them together, just put them out of the way for now. And also I've got the the silicon pads for the A and B button still stuck to the front there. It looks nice and clean inside. So what we've got to do is check how many points there are on here. And you can see there that this is in fact a 40 pin connector. Now you don't actually have to go along with a microscope and count all the bits. You can see here we've got pin one and pin 40 clearly labeled. So I do indeed have a 40 pin console. Now I did say earlier that there's no soldering needed. That is if you've got the other version. If you do have a 40 pin console you do need to do a little bit of soldering to remove that particular capacitor so for the 40 pin remove c54 and i did a little label to remind me that it's on this side and it's over here somewhere so we've just got to take a look in this area to see if i can find c54 okay so there's a green area here near the top and just as that gets close to the white area where they touch there is c54 so what i'll have to do is heat that and remove it i'll do that with some tweezers and a soldering iron. I think what I'll try and do, because I watched Marco's video on this, which was really interesting in terms of me preparing for this one. And what he did was he removed it, but then reattached it with just like one side connected, mainly just to keep it safe in case it ever needs putting back again later rather than throwing it away, which I thought was a really good idea. So we can see C54 is there. I do have some tweezers. Okay, so you, obviously you've got to be careful not to touch any other components. A bit of heat there. Just lift that off on this side you just have to kind of keep going there we go that's just come straight off the board there grab a hold of that with the tweezers it's still solder on each of those pads so i've not ripped it off completely and then just to keep that safe i can reheat the solder there That's attached at the other side and it shouldn't cause us any problems. Right, now one thing I spotted when I was doing my research about where to solder was that on the back there's these four points attached to the switch and that I should be using the left hand upper point on both switches to connect for their L and R button. But then I found elsewhere on another guide, TP9 and TP8 on the other side of the board would also work. So I'm assuming that there is continuity between those two. So if I take my multimeter, set it for continuity, so if I touch anything that has a uh, common ground like here and here, we'll get a beep. Okay, so on this side, it's TP8. We'll check on the upper left bit. Yeah, we've got continuity between those. So if I'm in place there and I check on TP9. 
yeah, that's fine. So that means I can do all of my soldering on this side, which is much easier than swapping some wires over there and reaching around and over. I can just connect them all up on this side. So the points I'm looking for are TP9, which is here, TP8, which I've lost again, it's over here somewhere there, and TP2, which is over here. Just noticing that the start and select contacts look a little bit dull. While it's open, it's a good idea to just use a pencil eraser to just rub over any of these button contacts just to improve the quality of connection there. Just sweep off any little bits of my rubber. So I've got a little bit of liquid flux I'm just going to put on the contact point. So some on TP2, some on TP8 and 9 on here as well. I could put a little bit on the ends of my wires as well. They are pre-tinned but the flux will definitely help. For soldering, what we're doing here is we're tinning. We're just attaching some solder to the surface first. With a soldering iron you just need to heat the surface first. Solder won't stick to a cold surface. Add a little bit of solder, leave the iron there to let it attach itself and then move away. So we've got some there, maybe a little more. Okay. So that's on TP8. We've got TP2 over here, so we'll do the same. Heat it, add some solder, move away. And TP9 over here as well. Now the tricky one was TP8 because I had like a little hole in the middle, so there's less to connect to. But all of those seem to be okay now. Now they will be making their way towards this ribbon here, so I'll need to direct them without... You don't want them all in the way because when the screen goes on, you don't want any, even though it's very, very thin wire, you don't want the wire to be causing the screen to sit further forward. So I need to think about how I'm going to route those cables. So I'll just take my time, get the wire in place, reheat my solder. And the wire is centered on that point. Okay, so TP8 is being a bit of a pain. I think I'm going to grab some fresh solder, clean the tip of my iron, get some solder on the wire itself, pre-tin that a little bit. Okay, let's give that another go. That's fine. It's just about patience with these things. You don't want to end up rushing anything. And then we've also got the TP2 wire. That should be a fairly straightforward one, he said confidently. That's fine. So now to try and route those. Obviously, I don't want it going anywhere near a hole. Let's just move that one out of the way. We'll get a little bit of a bend here. Now I may get a little bit of capped on tape just to hold these down in position. All right, so now that's three wires neatly in place. We've got our capacitor moved. All we need to do now is look at the ribbon that needs attaching. And I know we've not looked at the shell or the ribbon or anything else yet, but when I did my research, one of the things that I noted, and we've got it in here, is do the small ribbon and the wiring to the main board before connecting the screen should make soldering easier. So I will heed my own advice and hopefully that will pay off. So there's clearly two ribbons, one wider than the other. So the wider one is the 40 pin. The other one I think was 32 pin. Yeah, that looks about right. It looks like there's about another eight pins there. So not a 32 pin for this one. If you've got a 32 pin, hooray, you don't need to do the soldering to remove the capacitor. But as you can see from mine, it wasn't too difficult to do. Now, which way round does that go? In terms of putting the ribbon in place, the original screen you had the copper side facing outwards because obviously with these, you can fit them in one way or another and you've got to make sure you get it the right way around. So make sure it matches whatever the original was because on the back of the original it was just plain and the copper side, the bit where the connectors are, must be on the upper side of this here. Okay, so these two connectors uh, you can lift up with a spudger or you can get fingernails in there or depends on your fingernails. Uh, when that slid out of the way, it means that the ribbon should comfortably just slide in position. Might need a little bit of a wiggle, make sure it's level and then you can pinch down those two connectors ideally at the same time. Not always, because that little bump of solder from the link port connector was in my way. But that is now in position, that's all okay. So with that ribbon in position, it may look like this bit is in the way of the connector on the link port here. If I just turn that over, you'll see. But this folds over after all the wiring and everything, so it will be out of the way. By having it folded, it pushes it a bit more towards the front of the shell. Now with these three points, my wires are just about in the right place 
to connect to all these points. So I've got two options here. I could either cut the wires shorter and strip them, or I could reroute them slightly, which would avoid putting the strain on of stripping the wires. It would avoid cutting them maybe too short, and it mean I get the connections in the right place. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solder each one, then I'm gonna look at how I can reroute the wires with minimal disruption. So again, we've got a point to solder. Just put a little flux on each of those points. I'll prepare them with a little bit of solder. I'll just heat the pads briefly and add a little solder to each one. Make sure it has time to spread out on each. Then I'll get my wires in position. Okay, so in terms of direction, I think that the wires would be better if they were coming like towards from this way and then when it folds over, it will be, the wires will be heading upwards. Each one, heat it, hold it in place. The wire in position. Carefully, you don't touch the rest of the wire with the soldering iron. Key thing is just holding it steady after you've soldered. So the tape just stopping any bare metal bits getting in the way there. Right, that should be all okay. That's our motherboard all prepared, so I can just pop that out of the stand. Okay, so taking a closer look at the shell, it comes with the sticker to go on the back, which helps things look a little more authentic. It comes with a set of screws that I may or may not use. I can't always vouch for the quality on these things. And if I've got my original screws, I'll usually use them. It does indeed come with the little light pipe for the LED, which is the bit I always forget to put in when I'm reassembling these consoles. So you can see here, big difference in terms of the front there is that it doesn't have the bit to support the lens cover. It's just wide open. And also there is a slight bevel to this side so that the screen can fit in because the screen itself also has a slight bevel to its edge to help it seat correctly. So that's our front panel and it has a little bit here across the link port cover that needs to be removed. I'm assuming it just makes it easier for a more accurate mold to leave that bit in place. But I'll just use a pair of snips to get in there. Hopefully that'll be enough to just cut that out with minimal disruption. There we go. So that's okay there. Um, you could clean it up with a knife, uh, which is what I am going to do. So to avoid catastrophic damage to the shell, all I'm doing is dragging the back of the blade across the plastic rather than cutting in, because I don't want to cut in and gouge out any bits. That's nice and neat now. Uh, we're all good to move forward. So the shell looks nice. It's kind of semi-transparent, like a sort of frosted finish to it. Uh, and the texture is quite similar to the original shell. And in comparing the actual molding, uh, where it says power, where it's got the Nintendo logo, and sometimes on repro shells that can look laughably bad, it looks really good. It looks really great. And the screen itself simply just sits in place. So if I get that in position and line up with where it needs to go, and then look from the front, you'd see it just comes up flush at the surface there, which looks really good. Now the plastic cover is getting a little bit pinched here and there, so I'm going to take that off before I put it all together. Uh, it's not going to be a huge issue because it's like a glass lens and it'll polish up. Okay, so we've got the little post there for the LED to direct the light up to the power output. That goes into this hole near the shoulder button and there's a little divot out the side to help you line it up with a screw post to get it in just the right spot like that. Okay, next we'll take a look at my new buttons. Let's see what we got. So there's a couple of little metal connectors that add onto the shoulder buttons. We've got like these violet L and R buttons. There is the sides, which are just disappointingly dark gray. It matches the D-pad and power switch as well. We've got a lovely A and B button, high quality mold. One of the things I used to be really annoyed about when doing Game Boy Advance modifications is the button sets were terrible. There was a particular mold style that was going around and the A always had a little bump on it and the shoulder buttons didn't fit very well. So this is very encouraging that these look good. We'll get the pins in place on the L and R button. So let's take a look at the original, see how they were done. So if I've got the L button, it's got like the little pin with a bump facing that way. So if we look at this one, it's got a long end and a short end. We've got the bump facing the right way. It slots into that side here. We'll just push that into position. We get a pair of pliers to grip those and just nudge them in. That's clipped satisfyingly into place. We'll do the same on the right button. Slot it in place and use my pliers just to grip it and push it all the way in. 
that's okay. Right, in position, you got the little metal bit here, yeah. like that, which means it'll just resist enough for what we need. That will drop in, and we've got the bracket to sort out with that too. So this is our bracket, and you can see there's a little area here for this ribbon to go in place. So that will lift up and over. That sits on the back of the screen. This flips over and just sits in here like this. And then we've got the other bit there that attaches to our ribbon. So that will come over afterwards. This is gonna be a bit fiddly to get in. Okay, so I've had a few goes at getting in position and although it is a simple job, I am a simple person and I've been making the odd mistake. So here we are. Hopefully this is the one that is going to work. So the screen is now in the bracket, but it also has the protective film on it. Now I'm going to remove that so that we've got the beveled edge able to sit inside the bracket. But before we go in the shell, let's look at a couple of things. There's an overhang here. And there's two little points at the bottom, one here, one here. They are important because they are what hook over this part and these two openings at the bottom of the shell here and here. So you tilt it so it's facing like tilted towards the top of the console so that that part hooks underneath. I've got some fingers underneath just to stop it dropping. There we go. I can lower that in position now and these two points will line up with the parts on the shell here and here to keep everything lined up perfectly so as long as I've got a thumb here and I've got the overhang there everything else is lined up neatly I can see it's all in position where it needs to go and if I turn upside down you can see the screen looks absolutely perfect in the shell so now it's time to start adding in all the buttons and so forth. Now, when you're putting the buttons in, obviously they protrude slightly from the screen, so you'll need something to support it. So I've got this box of screws, which is about the right size to position that there. Then I can start looking at all the other bits that are gonna go in place. So I've got my D-pad over here. The D-pad itself actually plugs into the silicon connector. The start and select are actually an entire silicon unit. I cleaned the back of those off just to match up what I was doing before with the front of the motherboard. Now you'll see that the silicon slightly overhangs the bracket. I made the mistake earlier of trying to set up all the buttons first, but then all the silicon was in the way of the screen. So it's important to drop the screen in as your number one job. Then we'll put the sides on. So the side brackets on the original are like a light gray. Uh, but the ones I got with this kit are the darker grey. Now they match the D-pad and they match the power button. So I'll keep those for now. But I don't know. I might end up swapping to the lighter one. So that I get something that matches my light coloured start and select. Because I didn't buy a dark coloured silicon set. I've kept the original silicon pads. Because I tend to find with these consoles. The original silicon pads are usually better if they're still intact. Shoulder buttons. I can get those in position. And now comes the fiddly bit. Because we've got some ribbons to start connecting. And we've got the... Let's just one step at a time, Joe. Shoulder button's in place. That's okay. And make sure that the little sprung area works. There. And there. So now we've got the top half of the console that I was busy soldering earlier. I've got the ribbon, which is going to go in place. Now, obviously, the actual controls, A and B, up, down, left, right, are here. So this will eventually go that way around into the console. So if I just flip over, you can see where that ribbon goes into the, what should we call this? This little PCB that the screen comes attached to. There we go. So that's lifted up and flipped. I'll just carefully lift up so we can see. Um, do be really careful. I mean, that flipped up and it worked fine, but I've had these before where they've snapped off the bracket altogether. So be super careful with that. Um, when this is in place in the bracket, uh, you could use a little bit of double-sided tape just to secure it in place, uh, which is what I think I might do actually, just so that there's fewer variables that could end up falling out. I'll just move my bracket out of the way. Get my double-sided tape on. Peel off the back. Get that in just the right spot. Just secure that in position. Okay, so now with the opening for the ribbon lifted and my little secondary motherboard there secured in place, this should be fairly straightforward. Um, so we'll take the ribbon and I'll just carefully get that slotted 
into place here. Just slide it in so it feels like it's seated. Once that's in position, flip the top back over. Again, very carefully, you definitely don't want to snap that off. And we're almost good to go. Just hold these sides in position and take a little look. <laughs> Ugh, right. Time to open it up again. Okay, so yeah, this may look a little different um, because I have just had to open it up and remember to put in the silicon pads for the A and B buttons. So when you're putting it together, make sure you don't miss anything out. So that's got to fold down. We've got to line up the speaker at the bottom. Make sure that's in place. Don't worry about the shoulder buttons. We can put those in afterwards. You might need to use tweezers or a spudger or something just to tease the speaker into position. And this little pad at the top needs to be folded over and then everything should just kind of drop into place. Then we're ready for adding a screw. Let's start with this one. Now I did already thread this. So if I turn it anti-clockwise to look at a little pop and then put it in, that's fine. Uh, but on the first time in, you need to do uh, a bit of threading by going clockwise, anti-clockwise repeatedly just to cut a little thread in place and don't over tighten your screws. The next one here, just get in position. Screw that one in, make sure everything's in the right spot. Have a quick check that everything feels secure. So the tab at the top there on the ribbon needs to be folded over and ideally not pinched. Because um, I did find that, that the bit where it folds over can get a little bit pinched. So that's in place there. What I can do, my original Game Boy Advance only had two screws in use. I did get a set of screws with the shell. So I've added an extra one over on the right here. Again, don't over tighten anything. Just make sure everything is snug and the screws stop. I'll just watch these brackets out of the way so I can turn over and do an inspection on the front so that A and B buttons now responding correctly. Yes, well done, Joe. Start and select, okay, left, right. So this is where I judge what I'm gonna do. So these were the side brackets that came with the kit. So I'll take a look with those. So like the dark color on the side, it does look kind of nice. The only downside to that, start and select buttons look a little bit odd. Also, the screen doesn't quite sit correctly in the bevel at the bottom. If I actually just push the screen in place there, that sits flush there at the bottom, so that'll be okay. So, do I go with the dark colour bumpers that are a bit more interesting, or the original ones that match my start and select? Hmm. Oh, I know whichever decision I make now, people will be watching the video going, oh, Joe, you should have chosen the other one. I think I'll go with the dark. It's a bit different. I can always take it out and change it afterwards. Okay, time to get everything together. So we'll put the side bumpers in position. We'll get our shoulder buttons in place. So you've got to make sure that the spring is in the right spot so that that will have a little bit of resistance to it. Again, just a little bit of a quick test to make sure that's okay. The power button, make sure that's in the right spot. Now that slots in and clips in position at the bottom to get that click for on and off. I have no more screws to put in. I've put those three. So now I think I'm ready for the back shell to go on. So this is brand new back shell. I take off the battery cover because we know there's that screw in the bottom. Carefully line everything up and pop it in position there. Just make sure that the shoulder buttons are lined up correctly when it goes together. And then looks like everything is okay. Flush there when that pulls together. Right, so time to start putting some of the screws in. Now this is the larger screws, the tri-wing ones. I'll use my original ones, drop it in position, and then uh, start to get those in. Again, these are new screw posts, so you'll need to thread freshly into those. Just take your time, in, out, in, until you feel that stop. Obviously, again, don't over tighten top together we've got the contact bit in place for the brightness adjustments i'll get the phillips head screw in the bottom middle now of course at this stage it would make sense to pop some batteries in and test it before putting the other screws in now i don't know whether i am overconfident or a tireless optimist but i'm just going to screw it together and then hope for the best 
I actually really like the dark coloured edges with the light purple shoulder buttons. I think that was a good choice to go with because you've got the light touch here against the darker grey and then you've got the light touch here against the darker purple. Just feeling these, they feel great. Like on previous Game Boy Advance builds with the old button sets, they didn't feel nearly as good and they were always catching. And when you tighten up the screws at the top, you'd have to get them to like just the right tightness so that the buttons wouldn't seize up. But these seem like much, much better quality buttons. I think these are funny playing buttons as well. I'll have to check that, but I think they are. I got those from Zed Labs. In fact, I got the whole kit. I got the shell, I got the screen kit, and I got the button set from Zed Labs. I also got a capacitor kit, just in case I couldn't get my hands on a working Game Boy Advance and I needed to try and repair an older one. As it happens, that black one was working fine, so I had a kit to use, but I might do the capacitor install as a separate video at another time. So I've got six tri-wing screws in place. I've got one Phillips head screw in place. I have got some batteries kicking around somewhere. Here we are, those in place. Ikea okay, rechargeables are my go-to now. Hinge in the battery cover, that clicks in place nicely. Let's just give that screen a quick clean. Even without switching on, this is looking nice. So first impressions, the flush fit of the screen against the front is really nice. Everything's in place there. Shut up, Joe, switch on. Yay. So obviously because the laminated display is industrially attached to the screen itself, that means it is likely to be lined up perfectly anyway. But what we can do is we can do a little bit of testing to see if my work is correct here. So if I hold select, I should be able to press the right button and the left button. So left button makes it dimmer, right button makes it brighter. Now there is a touch sensor in here. I can't remember exactly where we had that. If we touch that, it might change that brightness. I don't know, I'm not a fan of the touch sensors and this one doesn't seem to be responding, but it doesn't really matter because I'd much rather have the select button. It gives much more accurate control over what we're doing. In terms of the position of the screen, it's pretty much perfect. There's nothing I need to adjust, but if we wanna just test it out, you need to hold L and R and select for three seconds. So that's on. And now there's like a green strip down either side, which is, pretty much even on both sides. I don't know if you can make that out there, but there's a, a little bit of green on the left and right. So I don't need to adjust uh, that positioning at all. Then if I go L and R and select again, hold them for a bit. Now that swaps to a green strip across the top and the bottom. And again, they are in exactly the right spot. I'm not sure how much my camera is picking up on that. By the way, this display looks really, really nice. I'll do the same again, L and R select that disappears and now I'm on the main screen. Now the AGS 101 screen in here, I was never particularly happy with. I found it wasn't that bright. Okay, now the funny thing is that although this does look bigger, they are the same size by having the outer border on this one, like not quite matching. And you can see that it makes the screen look a little bit smaller, but I've measured and they are both the same size. You can see like the way that the camera's picking it up, that it's the same sort of pixelated display, but the color's more vibrant on this one the brightness is better. The viewing angles, I'd heard things about the viewing angles of this particular screen because it isn't quite as bright as the IPS displays. But to me, it looks really good. It looks dead clean. And even from whatever angle you, you're looking from, it's okay. Now I know I'm only looking at the Game Boy logo at the moment. So let's just try something else. This is probably a familiar looking kit to many modders out there. It's the one that comes with the game bit adapters and the tri-wing and so on. Most of my screwdrivers have like a slightly wider column and then the smaller tip at the end, like that, whereas this one has a longer section where it's narrow and it's just right for fitting in that hole at the back. Now, of course, if you're gonna be sticking this on, you've gotta make sure you get everything set up correctly first. Uh, so with the test cartridge, what we'll do is we'll pop that in, hold down L and R and switch on. Wait for that to boot. And then we get to that menu. So we go to test program and there's LCD unit checker and flicker adjuster. So if I go to the flicker adjuster, I've already adjusted it and tested it. So that at the moment is perfect. If I just show you, if I put the screwdriver in, get that lined up with the potentiometer. If I rotate that to the left a little, it flickers or to the right a little, it flickers. So I just need to rotate just till I get to that sweet spot where there's no flicker at all and then we are good to go. So I'll switch it back off, take the cartridge 
out. Now I tried to do a little bit of a test play with this cartridge and it loaded up a blank screen. I don't want to just be blowing into the console because I want to be keeping that clean. Maybe should have cleaned up the cartridge connector beforehand, but a good way of cleaning up the cartridge connector is if you get a bit of alcohol, get like a cotton bud. So I've got a bottle here. I'll just go in and rub it across the contacts in my cartridge. And while they are still a little wet with the alcohol, I'll put it into my console, obviously with it switched off. Um, in out in out a few times and then again with the cotton bud other end of it this time rub along just see if it picks up any dirt should be okay so now we're good to go plug it in switch on boot up and i've got my clean nintendo logo there so that appears to be all working okay and you know what the screen looks really really good i like the ips screens a lot um, but I was expecting this to look not as good. I've got quite used to the IPS screens. This looks really crisp and I think the pixel perfect nature of it works well. I've seen about maybe a little bit of interference on the screen when you put pressure on near the edge or when you're pushing the buttons, um, but it doesn't seem to be particularly visible on this, which is obviously the, the final production model. The ones I'd seen were on Marco's video where it was... Um, you know, a pre-production model. So a bit of pressure on the B button there. You're not seeing any interference on the screen and on the D-pad as well, no interference. There we go. <laughs> Finally managed to move and I'm dead. But anyway, it, you know, you can see it looks good. Um, the animations are all good. I think, yeah, I'm really impressed with it. I'm getting the red flicker quite a lot on the power. I'm assuming that's down to the power drain of the um, LCD. Just turn it down a bit. Um, that was a freshly charged set of batteries. So I'll have to keep an eye on the power consumption, see how long it lasts uh, with a bit of gameplay. I love the purple shell with the purple buttons and the sort of violet shoulder buttons. And one thing I hadn't factored in that I actually really like is having the darker color on the side actually matches most of the consoles. So there's like a little bit of continuity that goes around with the dark gray, the purple, the dark gray, the purple, the dark gray. So that actually looks really nice. Okay, I've had a look around the shed and the only other one I can find is the Incredibles. So I'm getting this happening now and then when I'm switching on and off, uh, there's no engagement. I think it's when I'm quite quick. So I think I might need, I don't think it's anything to do with this kit. It's just that I might need to open it up and clean out the button. Again, something I could do in another video on faulty switches. But if you switch on sort of gently without pushing it too hard, it loads up fine. And once it's on, if you flicker it about, it's not wobbly. Um, it's not gonna cause us any problems. You should be able to make out like the pixels on the display there. I suppose now would be a good time, seeing as I've got the flicker adjustment all fine, to put my sticker on the back, um, which is always a little tricky to do. Let's turn that over, get it in position across the top. Let that drop. And stick that down in place. Hopefully I won't need to do the adjustment again now that that's stabilised. So it is, it's like a... It's not clear, but it's also not opaque. It's like a sort of a slightly translucent plastic that I think looks really good when you put the cartridge in. You can see the label just about through this gap here, which is quite nice. I've got the label on there now that I've done my flicker adjustment. I like the shoulder buttons. They respond quite nicely as well. They feel pretty good. I'm quite happy with how they are. They don't rattle. They feel quite satisfying to use. D-pad. A and B, all good. It's really nice. The mould, with it being a third party mould, obviously, traditionally, they were pretty poor. Um, but I've had some of the funny playing kit in the past and it's been really good. This is no exception. Everything lines up nicely. Everything fits neatly together. Feels nice and solid. Looks really good. I think the flush fit with the screen, having that beveled edge is a really clever idea. It doesn't seem to distort too much when you, you know, when you're pressing on the buttons. I've not noticed any distortion in the screen there. That is an excellent kit. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. So there we go, a brand new Game Boy Advance in 2022. It looks stunning. Um, 
I've got very used to using the IPS screens, both in my Game Boy consoles and in my Game Boy Advance SPs. I wasn't expecting to be particularly impressed with the TFT screen, but certainly the pixel perfect display really adds to the authenticity of the console. It looks crisp as when you're playing. The colors maybe not quite so vibrant, the display not as big, but there's a lot of pros rather than cons to this display. The adjustable brightness with the buttons is nice and um, practical. Uh, I didn't have much luck with the touching to try and get the brightness display to register. It works, but it's not as solid as the shoulder buttons. So if you are a little bit unsure about soldering, then it's a great kit for you because you don't really have to do any as long as you've got a 32 pin board. Uh, other than that, the soldering wasn't particularly difficult. There's only a few wires. The wires with the kit are really, really good. They're a suitable length. They're very, very thin. They're pre-tinned. That means they've already got a little bit of solder at the end, so they attach correctly. They added to the, the ease of the install. I didn't even end up having to cut or strip any wires at all. So that was fairly straightforward to do. Now I've done this video. If you want to see more Game Boy Advance videos, I've got ideas for projects after doing this. I'm all fired up on these again, you might be able to tell. Um, so I will have more coming up. So if there's particular things you'd like to see me do with the Game Boy Advance, then let me know. I've got my eyes out for an IPS screen and it'll be interesting to see how that fares against this once I've got the two side by side and if I'll still love this as much. I wasn't sure how the button set would look. This is meant to go in a grey shell to make it look like the American Super Nintendo, but I just thought that the purple might go well with the purple and it does. I've checked on the Z Labs website where I got all of my stuff uh, and they do sell a purple start select button. So I'm kind of tempted to maybe try that as well. Uh, I will be opening it up to try and investigate the switch. Again, Z Labs sell a replacement switch. So maybe on my next order for when they get the IPS screens in, I'll get a replacement switch for this. I'll get the start and select and I'll do a short video about the upgrade on this. But certainly as it stands at the moment, it's excellent. So of course, you're going to need to get your hands on an original Game Boy Advance console. Ideally, the 32 pin would make the job easier. But as you've seen with mine, 40 pin, no problem at all. You've got to remove that little capacitor. But other than that, it's, there's not too much that you'd need to do. Cost wise, so I got hold of the original Game Boy. The kit itself with the screen was £57.67 from Z Labs. The shell was £13.88. Now the quality of the shell is superb. You know, I've done a lot of modifications before with third-party shells that I've got off eBay and things, and they can be very hit and miss, particularly with the buttons and the shoulder buttons and things can be quite frustrating to work with. This is really good quality stuff. I, I was really impressed with how well and neatly everything fitted together, how solid it felt when I was putting the screws into the new screw posts. It's like it's, it's a piece of kit you can trust. Uh, Z Labs provided all of those, um, but the actual kit is all funny playing so the screen kit is funny playing the shell is funny playing and the button set which i said during the, the build may have been funny playing i checked and it was it was more expensive than the other sets of buttons six pound 13 for the sets of buttons which was the two side bumpers the a and b the d-pad and like purple shoulder buttons i think it was worth spending the extra on those quite happy with the quality of them uh so yeah that is a really nice new build i'm made up with it I'm going to spend the rest of my Saturday afternoon playing on it. Uh, if you want to see more like this, please do subscribe. I noticed the other day I hit 4K subscribers at some point. I am thrilled. Um, I don't normally bang on about please subscribe. I hate putting it at the beginning of my videos and things. But, you know, if you do watch my videos, if you've watched a few, you do enjoy them. If you sub, it does make a difference. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone who engages with my videos. And even if you don't sub, if you leave likes, if you comment on here, if you interact and you enjoy the videos, then... That means a lot to me. So thank you very much for watching. I'll have something else along soon and I'll look forward to showing off whatever my next staff project is. Until then, bye.